Hey, cheers, everyone. We've broken through 151,000 subscribers. And with me to celebrate is my dear brother, Jim Moulton, and my dear friend, Brad. My brother has opened a lot of champagne bottles with me in holiday celebrations. And I am so glad that he is here tonight to uncork this champagne. My brother and I grew up in Boise, Idaho. We climbed hills and trees, and he went on to become a helicopter pilot in the Air Force and in Vietnam War. And we now live only a couple of miles apart in Albuquerque. And Brad, we met to work on video projects all the way back in 2005. So it's been 15 years and I want to cheer all of you. Look, my brother did it, it's gorgeous. Oh, I love it, I love it. This is to me one of the elixirs of life in the matter world is champagne. Oh, this is fantastic. Well, we want you all to join us tonight, right now to drink a toast to more truth, more light, and more peace on this struggling planet. I love you guys. Cheers, I love you. And Fluffy and Chocolate are walking around and we love them too. But we figured that we were going to be standing up and no way to lasso them in, but you'll probably see them jump around on the furniture. So let's all do a sip. Isn't that good? It's it fantastic. Is. Very, very good. Okay. Now let's do one more toast. And this one is to another breakthrough <clears throat> that is so long overdue. We are not alone in this universe. And we humans deserve to know who is friendly, who is neutral, and who is unfriendly. Let's go for understanding that in 2021 for sure. I wish that you and I and Brad and Peggy and Eric and all of us at Earth Files, I wish we could hop around the world to see each of you wherever you are and get video and photographs of every one of you raising your glasses. But we do have a special email address just for this celebration tonight for you to send us photos of your cheers to Earth Files that Peggy will post at Facebook. And that special email address only for tonight's broadcast is photos at earthfiles.com. And already coming to us from the digital world is Robert from Poland who writes, Earth Files matters. And I really thank you for that, Robert. And we have a special toast here from Joe in California. And he put his champagne ready to go with one of my Earth Files t-shirts, down with entropy, up with light. And here is a red wine toast from Lion in Minnesota. And cheering us on from Philadelphia is my daughter, Laura, holding Tata, next to my five-year-old granddaughter, Hannah, holding three-month-old adorable teddy bear next to dad, John Mead. Congratulations, Mom, on 150,000 subscribers. We're so proud of you. Congratulations. Uh, I love you, Mom, Mom. Cheers. Cheers. And cheers and thanks to Earthfile social media manager Peggy and her husband Eric. They are shy and they like to stay behind the scenes in Canada, but we couldn't do this without them. Thank you guys. Love you. It's hard to believe. It was 51 years ago. That's an entire half century 
The NASA astronaut Buzz Aldrin, shown here in a photo by Neil Armstrong, walked on the moon while Michael Collins stayed in lunar orbit. And it was 11 years ago on the 40th anniversary of that first moon landing that on July 19, 2009, C-SPAN's Washington Journal in Washington, D.C., celebrated by interviewing Apollo 11 astronaut Buzz Aldrin. I had not heard this interview until two weeks ago and want to share with you now his revelation about the Martian moon Phobos that we all need to see. We should go boldly where man has not gone before. Fly by the comets, visit asteroids, visit the moon of Mars. There's a monolith there, a very unusual structure on this little potato-shaped object that, that goes around Mars once in seven hours. When people find out about that, they're going to say, who put that there? Who put that there? Well, uh, the universe put it there. If you choose, God put it there. And it was only four years after Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, and Michael Collins were on the moon for the first time that on September 7, 1973, The Tonight Show's Johnny Carson had Muhammad Ali before a big fight. But Ali wanted to talk about UFOs as soon as he sat down. You seem quite reserved tonight. What? I've been studying UFOs. Did you know there are UFOs out here flying around unidentified? <laughs> this would be the place for them, Southern California. <laughs> I'm serious. They sighted a bunch over Georgia. I've seen them at night. Uh, they have real photos of them, and the government and the people just completely seem like don't talk about it. But um, Mr. Harold Salkin of Washington, D.C., is the head of the National UFO Bureau. Right. He brought me moving films. I actually have moving pictures of little saucers, of gray steel objects coming into pictures that people took, and I'm just surprised that don't nobody talk more about it. Something they can. Another great insight into the fight game. No, I'm just kidding. No, I read that. But did you read the thing last night on the, on the news? No. That some physicists said that what the people of Georgia might have seen were that there are there are probably several thousand satellite objects no. going around no, the United no, States, around the Earth, and sometimes they disintegrate and they come back into space. Not 50 feet over the highway. Well, it could. It's got to land somewhere. No. They call it swamp gas and some they don't want. I don't know what it is, but... I think I do, but uh, they actually, there are actual saucers and objects coming within our atmosphere and flying around and people got pictures, everybody sight the same thing in every city, the red and blue and green lights, but the people, the authorities completely brush it off as if to say we are mentally off, but I know it's <laughs> right because I've been seeing them. Well, why don't they land then, Muhammad? I mean, if, now, if they're intelligent people, why wouldn't they land and step out and say, hi there, <laughs> or Galen Ding, whatever they say. <laughs> you know, why wouldn't they make contact? They probably figure they can't get no sense out of the people here in this country. <laughs> the Harold D. Salkin that Muhammad Ali mentioned to Johnny Carson was active in the early 1970s. And he was working with a civilian organization devoted to investigating UFOs that was called the UFO Investigators League, also known as UFOIL. Clearly, it is something that Muhammad Ali knew about when he talked with Johnny Carson. And now to everyone here tonight. For the rest of this hour, I look forward to your questions. And Peggy has some ready to go, and we'll keep gathering new ones through this special celebration broadcast and helping me with the clock. Brad will give me a time up if I get to three minutes in an answer. So Peggy, let's start with the first Earth Files viewer question tonight. Hi, Linda. First, I'd like to thank everybody for their Super Chats tonight. Oh, yes. So thank you, Moonbird, Marianne Chisholm, David Goldbridge, Vilma Verbis, Acapella, Jeffrey Rizzo, Terry Hendricks, Dolores Graff, Brandon Thomas, Demonic Hordes, Jessica Bradshaw, Doreen Garby, Evan Sonk, 
Dog Noses 3, Carolyn Boyce, and Gary Schmarks. Thank you, everyone. Oh, I really, really thank you so much. And uh, even Chocolate has now showed up to have some food around, so we'll see him jumping around for all of you who appreciate the cats and what we're doing. And thank you so much for your super chat. And before I go to the chat questions, I think there might be somebody else who would like to congratulate you, Brad. Do you think you have something from Jimmy Church? Yes, I do. Oh, my gosh, Jimmy. Linda, congratulations. A hundred and fifty <laughs> grand. That's pretty amazing. And uh, I don't know if you can hear me, Linda. hundred and fifty grand. Congrats. I'm drinking in the middle of the day. This is what happens. Congrats, Linda. Hey, Jimmy. Cheers. Thank you so much. May we get out of 2020 into 2021 with positive energy and we'll do a lot more radio. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Linda. Our first question comes from Amy Liu, I believe Amy's in the United States, and her question is, Linda, what do you think the alien agenda is truly about, and do you think it's about the souls? There's a lot packed in those two phrases of questions. In the beginning of September of 2020, I think for the very first time in my professional life and my own personal feeling about living in the matter world, that I've said to you all before that I think that the soul is the most important part of being human in this universe. But there is a lot that is happening behind the scenes in discussions with people who are in the government, in military, as well as a few of my colleagues. And they are becoming convinced that that is really true. And what that then forces in front of us is the question, why would we be in a universe in which there is evil? And when you get to that fundamental question, you ha that's the lens at which we have to raise and look at all of these various types, like some of the sketches tonight, but there are so many others. Lynn Buchanan, the remote viewer, I've had him on my Earthfiles YouTube broadcast in the past. And Lynn and I talked about this a great deal because Lynn said that in the uh, remote viewing that he did with others in Washington, D.C., Project Stargate, for the Defense Intelligence Agency and the CIA, that the eight or nine of them, talented enough to be brought together in that project, that they all real realized that they were tasked with this question. Is there other consciousness in this universe? And all of them came back, as Lynn Buchanan said in his words, this universe is teeming, teeming, that's his word, with consciousness. Now, consciousness does not necessarily, by definition, have to be organic. It could be that in the crystal world, in the inorganic, is something that we don't fathom. So I'm not trying to exclude it. I'm just trying to address the, what I'm thinking about to this question. What if this entire universe, 13.8 billion light years, is a holographic projection from another dimension, as many physicists think. And could this universe be an experiment, a huge experiment, with consciousness? And right now, that's as far as I can go tonight. What about another question? 
Okay, Linda, before another question, I think we have another video. Do you have something, Brad, there from Woodley Strieber? I do. Oh, wow. Surprises, surprises coming, you guys. I had no idea. If you want to hear these, Linda, just Thank put you. that in your ear. Temper. Thank you. Congratulations, Linda. Oh, Here's Whitley. to more and more and great discoveries ahead. A toast to the future, to the light, and to Linda Moulton Howe. <laughs> and I toast you back, Whitley. I toast you back. God love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, this is great. I had no, you guys, I had no idea that Whitley and Jimmy Church would be here uh, in this hour. So let's keep going with the next question. Okay, Linda, I have a question from Canada. Uh, this person would like to know what your top three books you would recommend for interesting facts and all things extraterrestrial science related. Top three books. Well, don't think I'm egotistical, but I would put An Alien Harvest that I first published in 1989 that includes uh, a huge focus on the animal mutilations, which are a big part of this issue and why it's so complicated and contradictory. And that led to the human abduction syndrome, which I go into in great depth for volume one and volume two in uh, glimpses of other realities. And I am not trying to overstate anything. I just really do feel that those first three books, the large ones that I did, uh, are evidentiary. And that is, is important to me. Uh, I have always tried to work by the pressure of fact, even if my subjects have been considered exotic or uh, otherworldly and therefore not relevant to the matter world we live in. I think we've all gone past that. I think that one of the refreshing things, if there is anything refreshing so far in the COVID year of 2020, is that most of us who have been investigating for a long time feel that there really is true motion going forward behind the scenes, whether it's Congress, whether it's people who have served in uh, the federal government, uh, military, one of the things that I do know from half a dozen is they want this to break open. They agree with me, Whitley, Jimmy, and so many that this is crazy to be in the 21st century on this planet and still be denied by the power brokers, whether the power brokers are human or non-human or both, the truth about our source about the interaction with so many other different types of intelligences. And when people say, well, Linda, they couldn't handle it. The common man can't handle the truth. I reject that. I reject it 100%. You guys, all the time, in your intelligent letters, in your intelligent emails, sometimes in videos, you, so many of you, are having firsthand interactions with intelligences that appear to be biological and they're not homo sapiens sapien. Why? Why should we be running in fear on a planet by power brokers who want to keep us dumb and in the dark? It makes no sense, not anymore. If we are headed now with energy to open this up and to open up all facets, then I'm ready to bring up glasses of champagne with you guys for New Year's Day 2021, hoping maybe that is finally the year. Thanks. Peggy, another one. Well, I hope you're not uh, sick of all these surprises because I think we have another <laughs> video from No, I'm not Eric, sick of anything. From Eric Van Daniken. Oh, my. Eric. Oh, okay. Eric, I love you. Yeah. Hi, Linda. Yes, Hi, you're Eric, one of the you know, heroes. The one with Janios of the Gods, etc. We are sitting here in Switzerland. The place is called Interlap. Beautiful weather. And you see this round table. We are discussing about you. 
You are a wonderful personality. <laughs> Julian, we all love you. Linda, you are the greatest. <laughs> Hi, thank you that you exist. Oh, you I love life. you, you Eric, and everybody, everybody who was. is there. Yes. Oh, yes. my God. Yes. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, oh that was fantastic. I love Eric Von Doniken. And when you look back, the first book, this is the truth, the first book that had impact on me, that we were living in some kind of a disconnect on this planet was reading Chariots of the Gods. And then when I went to Peru in 1986, and I was able to find a Piper Cub pilot down uh, in Nazca. And I told the pilot, I don't want to go on one of the tourist trip treks uh, around on the plains of Nazca. Can you fly me? And I want to be able to go up so that we go up high enough and I can take photographs looking down. And I had specific ones that I wanted to see. And then I asked the pilot, would you please take me down as low as you can go to that six mile, it's called the Nazca Airport. It's like a long, long, six mile long triangle and it had been measured in the last 10, 15 years, I think it's six miles long by a laser. But I was there in 1986. And the pilot told me when we took off, he said, I'm gonna show you why what they say around here that these were trudged with old, ancient human feet. He said, it's untrue. He said, I'm going to show you. He said, this six mile long triangle is pressed into the Nazca Plain, pressed down. And I have still have photos that I took with a small camera, not high quality, but enough that I've kept them. And when, when the pilot, he said, okay, start taking your photos. And we are coming down at the wide end of that long six mile triangle. And I can see with my eyes that here's the plain and this, the plains of Nazca. And it came down in a curve like this. And the pilot is the one who told me they've measured in parts of this, it's 12 to 16 inches pressed into the ground. He said, nobody trudged this triangle. And Eric, that's what you cracked open. That's what you cracked open for so many of us so long ago was, well, what are the facts? And why should we not be being told the facts that if you go there on your own with a pilot who knows what they're doing, they can fly you all the way into the Andes. And there are drawings in the ground up in the Andes, 100 miles from the ocean. The pilot did that. And you come back out. Why shouldn't we be told the truth? And that's what Eric, that's what Eric broke open long ago. You're a hero to me, sir. Thank you. I love you. Let's go on to another question. This is absolutely fantastic. Okay, Linda, we have a question from Greg Daniels. Would like to know if you have any more information on the UFO shoot down in Brazil. I wish I did. Um, I have reported what I would say were the strongest, the strongest uh, off the record coming from that military guy that uh, some of you wouldn't know and if and I don't want uh, to complicate his uh, life anymore. I had reached a point where there were three people who were going to do with Brad and me here from uh, the Maje or Rio de Janeiro area. They were going to bring a, a military a Brazilian military person who spoke Portuguese. We had lined up a translator and he was going to say that he knew for a fact that it was the United States Air Force that had a, some sort of a military exchange with what would be in the category of one or more UFOs. 
And that is the kind of step I wanted to make because we can have maps, which I have shown. I've had testimony about latitudes, longitudes. There was that first letter that allegedly came from a Brazilian military person who had a great deal of information that seems to have checked out. That also said that there were one or more shoot downs by the United States Air Force for reasons unknown. And the provocative sentence there was that two entities had been shot or somehow they had died. One lived for a while and they got to another latitude longitude, which I showed in my maps based on the latitude longitudes that were given by that military source. And when you then would, if you jump to the other information that I had hoped to be able to bring to you firsthand, the names of towns in those maps near where the military source originally said there were tall white entities that came out of one or more UFOs, that where those locations were given in latitude longitude, those towns also matched what the other military source was going to go into. But like what happens a lot of times with whistleblowers, he uh, let us know, uh, and we'll never be able to prove this, but he said his life had been threatened by somebody in the military who said, use my name specifically, you are not to talk with Linda Moulton Howe. And unfortunately, that's what happens in these cases, or some of them. Am I personally convinced, as a longtime investigative reporter of trying to understand what is the true relationship between other intelligences, our government and other governments on this planet, do I think that something that was not of earth manufacture came down in, it's not in Magé, it was outside of Magé, I do. But the next big enchilada is we need firsthand proof. We need photographs, videotapes of the entities. We need somebody willing to go on the record with me or someone to talk about what they know. And it's very clear that there are powers that be who were very upset that I and a few others were actually seeming to get latitude, longitudes that were correct. So that's, unfortunately, that's the sad uh, boulder or large mountain I'm up against in uh, proving further. So if any of you out there have any more firsthand information that can be evidentiary, that can be backed up by photos, by recordings, um, by firsthand information, try to get a hold of me. And as I say to people at the end of every Earth Files, uh, you can email me for first contact. You can use Proton Mail if you feel sort of mildly sensitive or you can use the hard US mail or Federal Express if you have something that is sensitive and you wanna make sure that I get it. So let's hope, let's hope we get a breakthrough about what happened in Magé because something, something really weird in that region went down. And let me say, when I talk about the US Air Force using a military strike I have no evidence whatsoever, and I haven't talked to anybody else who does, that would suggest that it was a hostile act. In other words, on a bell-shaped curve of that, are they friendly, neutral, or unfriendly? We always have to keep the possibility open and looking for proof that whatever went down in Brazil there might have been a positive and good reason for the United States Air Force 
to do what they did. So we have to keep as many doors open as possible until we have absolute evidentiary proof to close doors and say this is the correct one. Okay, Peggy. Well, I have to admit that my partner in crime for all of these vid videos was Serena Wright Taylor. Oh, and Serena. <laughs> and I believe that there is a video up next of oh, Douglas Serena. and Serena. Oh, this is one of my best friends in the universe. Congratulations. Hi, Serena. Hi, and Douglas. And Douglas. And the kitty. And Oh my Everyone gosh. Conscious Life Expo, of course, in Los Angeles. Congratulations and cheers to Earthfile's YouTube channel. Thank you so much for reporting every week. We look oh. forward to it. Thank you, Linda. Oh, thank you. Oh, that was fantastic. Oh, I love you guys. How everybody did this. Oh, wow. Wow. Hey, Peggy, Eric, I mean, this is something. I cherish well, it was, this. Serena was the brainchild, and uh, she just made it work. Oh, I love Serena. She's always been one of my very best friends. I just, and her husband, Douglas, is a very, very talented artist. And for those of you who may be going to Conscious Life Expo, you must seek out, you must seek out Serena and Douglas. They always have a table there. And uh, Douglas just, if you said, what do you think seven light years from here might look like in another uh, galaxy? Douglas can paint it for you. Amazing. Oh, Serena, I love you. Feel a hug through the electrons. Peggy. All right, Linda, I think we've got a great question here. It, it, it's, I'm sorry, I don't even know the country they're from. But the question is, if full disclosure were to happen, what part would interest you the most? Like, what part of disclosure do you think will be the most important? I want to know what each of the different types of non-humans want. I want to know <clears throat> if the tall ones are the ancient Anunnaki or some variation. For some reason, since World War II, for 70 years, we've all been kept in some kind of a murky darkness. And you will hear about grays, you will hear about blondes, you will hear about Nordics, you will hear about tall whites, oranges, blues, the list goes on and on. And when I have talked with people who have served in the military and they have had face to face with a non-human, and you hear them say, Linda, we would all like to be able to go to Starbucks with an ET and sit and learn about the universe over coffee. And it ain't going to happen, to use the vernacular. And what is the reason that I have been given? It isn't just one. This is now what I've heard in pieces over uh, 30 some 40 years whether it's a gray, whatever it is, that their telepathic control of the human mind and the human language center ends up overwhelming the human consciousness, usually. And I would like to know if that's true. I would like so much to have this all opened up to have the friendly and neutral non-humans introduced, even if half a dozen or a dozen of them are the genetic manipulators of already evolving primates to create Homo sapiens. Two million years ago, that primate in South Africa stood up and we called it Homo erectus. Everything I know is that Homo erectus was the product of genetic manipulation in already evolving primates by extraterrestrial biological entities. That they have been on this planet in this solar system for at least 270 million years, at least. 
Well, 270 million years, over 2 million. They may not even think this is our planet. You run up against this wall that if it is true that there have been three competing ET civilizations that have used Earth as a laboratory for 270 million years, as the Defense Intelligence Agency analyst told me in December 1999, then we humans may be kept in the dark because this really isn't our planet. There were surface life that is monitored, manipulated, and I really think, and I'm gonna say this because I don't mean this to be dark, I really honest to God believe that the homo sapien that is now to the Homo sapien from Erectus two million years ago has a powerful and strong soul. And that when the Eben told an Air Force captain at Los Alamos Laboratories in 1952, 49 to 52, reincarnation, the cycling of souls, is the machinery of this universe. We, meaning the Ebens, we made you, we put you here, but you have to live it. I don't find any of that upsetting or frightening. What I do feel is that there are consciousnesses throughout this huge universe that mix and match and do life form experiments throughout the whole 13.8 billion light years, probably, if we knew the truth. The, the gem, the diamond to it all, is consciousness. What consciousness evolves in which container and which container has a powerful soul? I know you do. I know we do. Homo sapiens sapien. The next huge step, it seems, has to be, we've got to be introduced to the true history, to the truth about what we are, and especially, what is this future we are going into, in which Elon Musk says he's going to put a million humans on Mars, through his Starlink cruiser by 2050. And we're already coming into close to 2021. If we're going to start putting a million people on another planet in this solar system, we all deserve the truth about our source, who is here on this planet underground, under seas with us, on Ganymede, I know that there are ETs inside, inside of Ganymede, Mars. So this is how complex and why I would yearn, do yearn, to have a download telepathically that I could absorb about the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And then to come here and report it to you. Where are we now? Hey, Peggy? This, uh, Sorry we... about that. Um, <laughs> I believe we have one final video. Brad, I believe it's Alan Steinfeld. Oh my gosh. Oh, Alan. Oh my gosh. Congratulations, Linda. I am so happy for you and all the people who have benefited from your knowledge. You're the best. And we're not going to stop at 150,000. We're going to get 300,000, a million, and then beyond. Congratulations. We wish you well. Alan! <laughs> I love you. Thank you. Yes. I would love to go for 35 million sort of like the Kardashians 35 million number, but meaning 
35 million people on this planet finally broke through and knew we're not alone. This planet is inhabited by others as well. And so is the solar system. And you guys, you know, and you know how hard it is to communicate. But, Alan, I know you join me in the truth. Thank you so much. I, here's a cheer. I just can't thank you all enough. This is really fantastic. We have a great question here from Santa Muerta Live. When, if ever, do you plan on having your books in audio version? Well, that is a wonderful question, and Eric and Peggy and Brad have talked to me about it, and I, I want to do it. And um, I'll, I'll ask you guys what you would do. I work literally 18-hour days. My fun is in the challenges and the people and what I am reading in those 18-hour days, but they are 18-hour days. And it goes seven days a week unless I pull out a day and just say I'm going to walk and run and I'm not going to continue uh, with my head in a book, in letters, the computer, uh, radio interviews. And what I'm laying out is the dilemma that to do the audio books would probably, Brad, you think it would take two or three months, don't you? And it would be doing two or three months, which I really would love to do, where I would be in a room, in a microphone, and Brad would be overseeing the, uh, the recording because I'd like to talk my books out to you guys. So it's how do we get the time shoved in to doing all of the rest of this. That's been my dilemma. I really have a desire to do that, and I'm not sure what the answer is, but if I can, I, I promise you, I will try, and Brad will work with me, and if we get one book done, and we see how that goes, we might be able to do a second book faster. And maybe I will try, I will say this, I will try to get at least one or two of my books into the audio versions in what Amazon and Vimeo and, and all of that, however they're distributed, uh, in this coming year. I, th I think that if we commit and we know how to do it, we could do it. Because um, I know this is a world where traveling and listening to books is a big part, and thank you for being interested. We'll try. Okay, Linda, the next question is from Arkansas. Linda, do you have an opinion as to why worldwide historical evidence of the former existence of giants is being suppressed by authorities? It is an excellent question. I had this uh, in an email just a couple of days ago, and I, I was replying. Uh, I worked in Washington, D.C. off and on. I worked for, uh, uh, on a PBS special having to do with chemistry and a series uh, of uh, where I had to travel with a crew uh, in a series. And my particular subject was the mole, how you measure molecules. And when I was working on that, uh, there was a colleague of mine in Washington, D.C. who told me, uh, they were in journalism. He said, did you know that the Smithsonian has 9 to 12 to 14 foot skeletons that were dug up like in the early 1800s and they were taken to the Smithsonian and they have been hidden in some deep dark room because everybody thought that nobody would be able to accept that the giants in the uh, Bible were real. Uh, the, the part that starts in Genesis about how there were these giants and David and Goliath and uh, that the giants had six fingers and six toes and all of that. Well, I asked, I said, wouldn't this now 
couldn't that as evidentiary information, if you've got skeletons of 9 to 15 feet, why can't that be opened up? And, and they could say, well, we thought in the 1800s that people wouldn't be able to accept it. Well, it's the 21st century. If those skeletons are still in this dark, deep room in the Smithsonian Museum, why shouldn't they be opened up to us? The problem is, if you go, if you write a letter, as I've been told, to the Smithsonian and you say, can you confirm that you have the 9 to 12 to 14 foot skeletons down in one of your basements, you either will not be replied to or you'll get a no answer. It's like UFOs and abductions and everything else. We're living in this strange, strange period on Earth. We're getting actual facts and truth is the single most difficult challenge. So that I can share. That was a direct discussion with a colleague when I was working on a science series. It had absolutely nothing to do with UFOs and was told that there are these giant skeletons, and the decision was that they must be hidden. Uh, I don't know. Would it work if you, all of you guys started writing letters to the Smithsonian and saying, can't we see the 9 to 14 foot skeletons? Maybe that would do the trick. I don't know. Okay, what about another? We have another question here from Jill Mo. He says, there has been nothing concerning the Dragonfly drones. Do you believe that this was a hoax or something else? Congratulations on your work. Thank you. Oh, no, the Dragonfly drones were no hoax. Uh, this is a very serious subject. And what a lot of people, I think, didn't realize, and I've had the uh, ability, anyway, to talk to some people in the military about this, those were not human-made, and they were, uh, we'll say, high technology in invisibility. And one source told me, we kind of think that these dragonfly drones have been in and around the Earth and the solar system for a very long time, but they have always had perfect invisibility, and that what the United States government, and maybe Russia, maybe China, what they have been able to do with the evolution of invisibility of aircraft in the skies is based on what we have learned from ETs and from some of the crash technology or planted technology. The Dragonfly drones remain in my work, I have a whole huge 2007-2008 Earth files about the Dragonfly drones. Um, they led to people who were trying to study them in infrared, the whole issue of invisibility, that they were perfect, and that why were they suddenly seen for a period of time? A scientist said this, a military source said this, because the United States government had finally cracked how they could reveal, through some counterfrequency measure, the invisibility of these extraterrestrial craft. And if you remember, what made it so interesting is the Dragonfly drone would flicker, would flicker in and out of invisibility. And that was seen by many people in many parts of the United States. So that was also reinforcing the uh, description by people who had actual knowledge that we had cracked something and that we were doing some sort of a jamming and then they would come into view and then the Dragonfly drone would do something to counter the jamming and then it would go back into invisibility. What I cannot tell you is who exactly is the other intelligence responsible for the Dragonfly drones, the what's called 
self-activating software that was in the patterns on these dragonfly drones that a scientist wrote a lot uh, that I have and others received about invisibility, projecting holograms, neutralizing gravity uh, as being the tools of ETs interacting with Earth. What about one more in this uh, round? And then Brad and I have a surprise for you guys before we go into a second round of questions. Sounds great. We have a question here. If we have 8 billion people in the world and souls are finite, where do the souls come from and continue to multiply if they only recycle? What is the source of the word finite number? You have to ask yourself that. Who knows or says or insists that there's a finite number of souls? It may be that the truth is, after talking with Roger Penrose two years ago in a mind-blowing discussion with him, when I started my first question with Roger Penrose, who has written a brilliant book called The Cycles of Time. I said, perhaps naively, I was thinking of everything, souls, human organic life, inorganic life. And I said to him, there's a lot of controversy about the singularity source of this universe. And before I even asked the question, Roger Penrose, in his beautiful, soft, gentle UK voice, said, Oh, no, Linda, no, no singularity. There was never a singularity. He said, We live in a huge cosmos. It could be an infinite number of universes, an infinite number of time lines, and all cycles. All cycles from no beginning in through infinity to no end. And I had never heard someone who has such a profound control of the language, English language. If you read cycles of time, you can read in and around his equations. And it was the first time in my existence that the idea that there was not a singularity, that there was not a beginning, as we have been taught, of maybe one universe, but that this universe could be like a thread of an infinite number of other threads, and that each universe functioned at a different frequency. As the Bible has said in the beginning was the word, word is frequency. And I came away from that discussion with Roger Penrose thinking about, we have, in a way, we have been taught as humans such a narrow band. We're in a narrow band of our relationship to the universe. And what's beginning to happen with him and with the people who are writing papers about that we could be in a truly in a holographic universe. If it's a holographic universe, from the beginning, it had to have been projected from another dimension by definition of hologram. I find all of this exciting. I don't think it's scary to think we're in a universe that's being projected by some other intelligence. I don't think it's scary to say there was no singularity. That, that has been rejected by some scientists. Whatever, ultimately, we as humans are going to learn as we clearly are beginning to go out officially into the universe It's the truth. That's what we got to find out. 
we have to get out from under the thumbs of power brokers. We've got to find out the truth. So, there, Peggy is my, my thinking. Now, it's at the bottom of the first hour, and we have another hour, and we'll pick up on more questions, but Brad and I have put together something that I think is really uh, special and in some ways touches on some of the questions we've been through now in this hour, which I can bring up. That's Fluffy. Look, Fluffy's joining us. Maybe chocolate. Chocolate's at my feet. And here's Fluffy coming. Oh, dear, bless his heart. Here, I'll try it. Here, you guys. There. Now you can see Fluffy. Um, some of what we're going to be exposed to now touches around some of these questions in the first hour. So out of the film, uh, we will I'll go to your questions, but you may be provoked for questions that you haven't thought about by what we're going to share. So now... I get myself back on track of where we are and, and not block Fluffy. Okay. Here we are now at the beginning of the second hour celebrating with our champagne that we've gone through three or four glasses, I believe, in and around some, of cracking through 150,000 subscribers and growing and that every single week now I am getting, in some cases, really profound information coming from, and when I say profound, meaning the people are having interactions with other intelligences that are provoking them or leaving them with information or questions about what their true humanness is on this planet, in this solar system. And I'm now going to share with you an extraordinary encounter of a father in Utah who was stunned to see three seven-foot-tall, non-human gray beings focused on the man's five-year-old son. But the father is paralyzed. He cannot move. The only part of his body that he has any control over at all are his eyeballs. The date is June 14th, 2019. It's only about 14 months ago. This is current. The father's name is Tyler Thomas. He is 36 years old, works at the Huntington, Utah power plant, and loves his family. He and his wife have a teenage son, a younger daughter, and a five-year-old boy named Crew. That week in mid-June 2019, the teenager was playing in a soccer tournament in Cedar City, Utah. So the whole family traveled 193 miles southwest from their home in Farron, Utah, population about 1,600, through Fish Lake National Forest to Cedar City about 34,000 residents. The family rented a B&B &B on their second night, and they were in their second night at this rented house in Cedar City when Tyler Thomas suddenly woke up at 3 a.m. Everybody's getting ready for bed. My wife and the oldest were in a bedroom of their own. I slept out on the couch. And my youngest boy, Crew, he wanted to sleep out on the other couch by me in this living room. The way we were sleeping, my boy was sleeping on a couch that was perpendicular to mine, shaped in an L. And his head would be towards where my feet were. Fall asleep, and I wake up. Gosh, what time is it? So I look at this clock that's up on that mantle below the TV, 
and there's just enough ambient light that I can see the time pretty much straight up 3 a.m., and that's where things were weird. I go to move my head, and I can't. I go to turn, I can't. So I'm thinking, am I dreaming? I can only move my eyeballs. I can only move my eyes. I can't wiggle my toes, my fingers. I can't so much as roll. Nothing. I can't do anything. So I am looking, and there was just enough light coming over the island in the kitchen. I could see figures. There was one figure right in front of me. And the height? Every bit of seven feet. The ceilings in that house were vaulted. So unfortunately, as far as like sand off of an eight foot ceiling, I wouldn't be able to say exactly. But I know from where earlier standing in the room, where like my height was in correlation off of the mantle where the clock was, this figure, when I was looking from the clock and noticed that the shape come out of the shadowy part of the room, and I seen all these details and color, it was definitely no less than six, seven, six, eight, somewhere in there. Concrete gray color, I would describe it as. The bigger eyes and this alien just staring at me. This deep, deep just stare, just staring right into me. And I'm still thinking this is a weird dream. And I've never had a dream once in my life about aliens. I've never dreamed once about UFOs, nothing. I have the impression of you lying on a sofa. Your son is at a 90-degree angle where your feet are, and that there is a clock. Clock is to my left and up about 45 degrees. Where is the seven-foot tall gray being? It'd be to the left. It's about 10 feet at the most away from me, just staring right down at me. Where is it in relationship to the clock? would be behind it, it'd be further away from me than the clock, and probably three feet towards the center of the living room from the clock. I have been able to get my eyes moist enough to see that it is just past 3.05 a.m. Now that my vision is well enough is when the shadowy figure comes through, because at this point I can't move my head. I can just see from about the waist down. I have my left side of my face is on the pillow, and I roll my eyes up, and I'm scanning the body, and that's when I see that the light coming over the island from the kitchen, the light would be directly to the right from the figure and the clock and my boy. I notice that the complexion of the skin seems kind of soft, smooth, just like ours. It's about like a concrete or a primer gray color, no shine, a flat gray. I can see the muscular structure of the forearm and the bicep. I can even see the larger veins running down the bicep, down the forearm. I could not quite see the hands because they were too far down into where it was too dark to see but I could see in great detail the face, the eye placement, the size of the eyes, the small mouth, a little bit of a protrusion off the face for a nose. I could make out that there was a very distinctive jaw, a lower jaw. What was the shape of the head? The head would be more like a pear, but with more of a concave shape that would go to where the stem would be. The head at If you was to say, like, where the ears would be, which I did not see any ears, but where ears would have been is about where the head on both sides started to concave in to the jawline, then made a little bit of a swoop out and down into a smaller chin. So it would have quite a bit smaller mouth and chin area, larger from the nose up, from the nose down, quite small. And the eyes? The eyes, the round part of the eye would be close to the shape of almost a golf ball and go right down to pretty much a teardrop shape. Very large eyes compared to human. Any clothes? No clothes. No organs. 
I did not see any sex organs, did not see any clothes. Do you see in your mind's eye any symbols, hieroglyphs, numbers, images at that moment? I remember looking at my broken up reflection of myself on the couch and the very shiny eyes. Give us second by second. Second by second, I've now entered to what I would say a couple minutes of looking this figure over. I'm moving my eyes around. I'm thinking, all right, any minute I'm going to wake up. And I've stayed awake long enough in this experience. Something just snapped in my head, and I remembered, oh, my gosh, my little boy, he's laying next to me. Where is he? What's going on? And I can't move, but I move my eyes as far as I can and notice two more figures, exactly as the one I have seen, two leaning over my little boy on the couch. And it was at that moment, you know, it was... It's okay. I kind of, I kind of, I was kind of scared. I remember thinking, okay, dream's over. And I just remember thinking, hey, what are you guys doing over there? Like, why are you by my boy? And then I remember thinking, this isn't a dream. I can't move. I can't talk. So I tried telepathy. You know, if I think in my mind what I'm wanting to say, maybe they will somehow communicate back with me, which never happened. Not once. Hmm. Other than seeing a flash of light, which I'll tell you about, but I remember very vividly, I am now trying to communicate with them. Hey, what's going on? I'm very interested in this. I love this stuff. I watch all the shows. Talk to me. Please talk to me. I want to know more about you. I'll tell you what you want to know about me. Mm -hmm. Please talk to me. Nothing. Just those same glossy, glassy black eyes staring right at me. And... I was at that point pleading with the one closest to me. The other two were not looking at me, but I could see the reflection on the right sides of their face, on their eyes, just like the one in front of me, the way the lighting was. I couldn't see my boy, but I could see them leaning over him enough to where I knew, I knew something was going on. I knew they was doing something. The only thing I could tell was from the position of the end of the couch, where his head was, which would be closest to my feet, that where they were positioned would be up around his face area, for sure, which is actually very interesting for another part I'm going to tell you here. So what's going on now, Dad's getting mad. I'm getting very agitated. They're not communicating with me. They're not moving away from my son. I feel powerless, and I'm getting very upset. I'm getting angry thoughts. I'm trying to tell them, you know, hey, get away from my son and tell you tell me what's going on. Nobody goes by my son. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you're doing. At that point, I remember I try to get up, and it's just nothing, only eyeballs. So I remember thinking as deep in my subconscious as I can, I'm going to count to three, and with everything I got, I am getting off this damn couch. I'm going to give it everything I have. I kind of did a one, two, three in my head, went to move with everything in my body. It was a flash of light. I see this flash of white light, and just as soon as I've seen this light, I'm awake again. Or never went to sleep, whatever you want to call it. But this time I can move my head. I slowly kind of get up. First thing I do is I look at my boy. He's sound asleep. I have no immediate pain or anything. I don't feel weird. So this has been like maybe five seconds after I've seen this flash of light, according to my time frame in my mind. And what I remember was, which is very important, my eyes are already moist. My eyes are almost actually runny. I've been awake this whole time, Linda. I was not asleep. Every time I wake up, my eyes are dry. Mm -hmm. Whether I lay down for an hour I lay down for the night. I wake up six hours later. I wake up. I have dry eyes. I come out of it, however you want to put it, after seeing this flash of white, and my eyes are moist, actually very wet from being upset earlier. Um, What the hell was that? This had to have been real. Perhaps what they was doing was so important, they had no time for anything other than let's get this done and get out of here. Shortly after being home in Farron, 
We wake up that next morning, and my boy had a very raspy voice, almost like he had like a ventilator in his esophagus, or he had his throat scraped or something. It wasn't a stuffy nose. It was a voice that almost sounded like he had irritation on his voice box or in his throat. I'll never forget the one staring at me. The other two, I could only see about chest up on those two that was by my boy. I kept trying to talk, but couldn't. You know, the reason I've held off so long even talking about this is just because of how you feel so out of place. Like, you can't just go tell people this. I've told my wife this, and I've told my very best friend. I've not told my mom, dad. I've not told anyone that I know would be judgmental and act like I'm a weirdo. After our interview a week ago, I sent Tyler four illustrations by other people who have encountered gray beings. This one, done in charcoal of a gray being with a pear-shaped head, was a November 1980 case in Longmont, Colorado that is in my book, An Alien Harvest. This is an image that has circulated on the web as an actual photograph of a gray non-human, and no one knows exactly the source. This third one is an illustration of a very tall gray type that has also been circulating on the web without giving source details. And this fourth image is the one that Tyler told me was the closest. He looked at all four and sent me back an email and said, this is close to what was in that house in Cedar City. This illustration was done by a U.S. Army sergeant after he woke up in 2015 to see these approximately seven foot tall gray beings at the foot of his bed. How many of you in the Earth Files audience tonight have seen any entities, whether exactly like these or different, up close? Or other types? If you have, please send me emails, proton mail, or hard mail with details and sketches. I would really like to be able to share uh, sort of like weaving in and out of our Earth Files YouTube gatherings here on Wednesday nights. People who have current interactions with something that is other and can show us through their sketches. I think it could be valuable, especially if we are finally going to be coming to that big crack in the human consciousness that we've been waiting for for so long. We're not alone in this universe. Finally, in headlines and TV and radio and every possible media around the world, with somebody or a lot of people explaining, if we're not alone, who is with us, who is out there, how uh, does it all work, and who are we in relationship to those that seem to be monitoring and manipulating, not in fear but to strengthen. I, if, I, if I've learned one thing in this life, and I've had an adventure-packed life, you only get stronger if you know truth. It's simple. Now, Peggy, let's go for a second round of questions. Great, Linda. I have a question here from Moonbird, and her question is, of all the cases you've investigated, which still leaves you the most stumped, puzzled, or at a loss for words? That is really, really an excellent question. And I'm, I'm going to go with what immediately came into my head. It goes back to 1983, I was trying to produce the documentary for Home Box Office. 
had a signed and dated contract with the executives at Home Box Office in New York. The name of the documentary was going to be UFOs, The E.T. Factor. And this is where, between 1983 and 1985, I had a lot of people, allegedly military, allegedly intel, allegedly science, coming at me in all sorts of ways. And two of those individuals during that period of 83 to 85, I call Sherman, I put them together under the name Sherman in my book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2. So you can read more around what I'm going to say now. But this is what's haunted me. With one of these two men who seem to know a great, great deal about MJ-12, the workings of, we'll call them SAP operations, uh, under magic and issues having to do with what kind of a universe are we in. And this man said, MJ-8, specifically that's who he said, MJ-8 says that we've had communication with some of the greys and they say there really is a devil and that they are as afraid of the devil as we humans are. And I said, what is the context? What is the context for a devil in our universe? And this was the answer that I have, I think haunted is a good word. The answer was indelible in my brain. This universe is one of an infinite number of universes. It's only, this is the only, Linda, this is not the only universe. There's an infinite number of universes. But they are surrounded, all of them, by a cold, dark sea. And each universe is like a grain of sand on a beach inside of that cold, dark sea. And I said, sir, what is the cold, dark sea? And he said, I'm telling you the truth, Linda. I've asked myself, and the only answer that I get from MJ-12 is, or that MJ-8, you don't want to know. That has haunted me since 1983. What kind of a cosmos are we in? How many universes our schools, battlegrounds, experiments. And I think that the reason why this is so important to consider is if we're in a universe that is completely different than we have been taught amid a range of other universes with all of these mysteries and questions about dark matter, dark energy, the cosmic ray-like particles that came ramming up through Antarctica in the last 12 months, and scientists are very confused about where they're coming from. It's as if we came through a certain kind of Socrates and scientific evolution to what we say are the rules of this universe. But we're missing all of the other universes and the interactions with them. And then finally, we're missing hugely. What would the cold, dark sea be around an infinite number of universes? And you and I are only in one. And in this one, 
We are only in a tiny tributary of an arm next to a bigger arm of the Milky Way galaxy, which Hubble has now proved. We are in a galaxy of which there are trillions of galaxies in this singular universe. And when your mind begins to try to absorb this, Greys, reptilians, blondes, Nordics, whites, tall or short, blues, oranges. It seems inevitable. As Lynn Buchanan said, all the remote viewers, the universe is teeming with consciousness. But what is consciousness? in different organic entities and perhaps even inorganic. This is how far we are, I think, from understanding even the universe we are in. And it all goes back to that which haunts me the most. What is the cold, dark sea surrounding the beach in which every sand grain is a different universe? keeps me going. That's why I want to do this. <laughs> so what's another question? I just want to bring up a quick note to Brad that maybe the audio is slightly out of sync. Oh, wow. Just started. Oh, really? It, good, because uh, I would really like to get that answer that I just gave myself. <laughs> I know Brad says he doesn't. He doesn't know. Do you want me to restart? Did, yeah, Peggy and Eric make an executive decision. Should we stop and restart? I will send him a begin soon, and I'll restart. Okay, Brad said, if there is any question on the audio, he should stop and restart. Yeah, going you on. what? Do you guys agree? I don't, I don't see anything. Okay. We're back up and running. All right. Uh, age of COVID, age of digital, age of experimentation, and probably the whole world is using so much uh, digital um, material now that these sort of things happen occasionally. But don't you guys think at this point that this has been fun and... Uh, that uh, if we could just keep on doing these kinds of Q&As and looking into segments of people who are actually interacting with other intelligences, that independent of everything that governments are trying to control, that out of these kinds of dialogues, very honestly, we might be able to just keep learning on our own and then eventually, whenever the government makes the announcement, we're already there. I, and forget about whether or not we can always keep the, the electrons going. So Peggy, what about another question? We have this question from Greg DeSalle in California, and he would like to know how many pyramids do you honestly think are under Antarctica and in Alaska? That is a really good question, and it ties directly to what I have talked with you guys about before, in terms of my investigation of the Dark Pyramid that may be uh, 60 miles west of Mount Denali, 150 feet down to the vertex, 550 feet to the base, so uh, 750 feet base pyramid beneath the land in Alaska. And the reason I bring it up is that in the process of doing all of that work on the Dark Pyramid, um, it became very clear to me from some sources that one of the things that ETs have either shown 
our government have communicated with someone that the whole pyramid construction on Earth is replicated out through this galaxy and perhaps beyond this galaxy. And that pyramids are fundamentally communication machines and energy machines. They're machines. And that one of the keys to people who have begun to understand some of the ET communication, if they put pyramids in 270 million years ago, half a billion years ago, whatever ultimately is the beginning of pyramid building on the earth. It was done under a computer generated grid system. You put a pattern of, of a pyramid of very specific angles very specific crystal substances like limestone. And you do the pyramid grid on very specific magnetic field and other field lines on any planet if, they have, if they're generating a magnetic field. And that the Earth is an example in which there have been surface pyramids probably at least 500 million years old. And that the surface has another layer like the one that is allegedly to the west of Mount Denali. Its base is 750 feet below the surface of the earth. We live mostly on the surface of the earth not the military, they've got huge underground installations, but the average citizen of 8 billion people on the earth lives on the surface. So the idea of a 550 foot high pyramid being 750 feet base underground, that boggles a lot of human minds. And what I'm trying to give you an image. If you imagine what we know about surface and a lot of surface pyramids haven't been revealed yet either, that they are in a uh, network that has to do with the network of pyramids that are built beneath the surface of the earth. And I've talked about it. It's like black keys and white keys on a piano. And it all has to do with frequencies. And if you are advanced, you have advanced computers. If you know how to take a whole planet as spherical geometry, and you know then how to place exactly the right size pyramids on the surface in relationship to one grid and the others underneath, you will have communication and you will have energy worldwide infinitely. So the bigger question, who built these grids really on earth and where did they go? Why did they leave? And why is this amazing physics in relationship to spherical geometry of a planet? Why is it denied us? Why can't we have free energy and free communication from activated pyramid grids? What about another question? We just had a, a great follow-up question from Richard Gmail. He was wondering, could the shifting of the magnetic poles affect the pyramids somehow, maybe making them power up? I've actually had discussions about exactly that kind of question is that we have uh, such a, a narrow and thin understanding among most humans about what is the relationship between well, what even causes pole shifts. Yes, we understand that there is this huge machinery that is going on around this 70% uh, the size of the moon, 
huge iron crystal core at the center of our planet that is moving in an iron, uh, mostly iron and partial nickel uh, sea or river that is fluid. And between the crystal and the fluid, we get the dynamo. And the dynamo generates the magnetic fields that go out and why we have Van Allen belts and poles. Well, what makes the poles shift? Um, I have kept a note. I think it's, uh, here it is. I have kept this note. There have been 184 North and South Pole changes in the last 83 million years. 184 North South Pole changes in the last 83 million years. And this planet is 4.6 billion years old. So it hasn't just been 184 pole changes. If, if the climate and geophysical changes of the planet have something to do with what happens into this rhythm of north to south, south to north, it's probably something that the non-humans with all of their advanced intelligences not only understand, but they have the technology to anticipate. They have the, anticipate, the knowledge to know where to go, what to do, or even perhaps how to manipulate something underground that may or may not affect. And the one bottom line is we humans kept out of the black world since World War II. We know so little. These are great questions, but we do not have factual information. If others do, we don't have it in the white world. And it's a frustration of mine. You're asking great questions. We should have hard answers, but we don't. But that's why to get together on Wednesday nights at Earth Files YouTube channel and we will keep trying as best as I can to bring you more and more and more evidentiary, I hope, information and facts. And this is a big one. What, how this planet works, how it really operates, what happens in the poles and who takes advantage of being able to manipulate that. Okay, what about another? And this question comes from Robert Fullington. He's from California, and he wants to know, what's your take on the human hybrid program with hybrids living among humans? As far as I know, because I've talked with a geneticist who is studying this, no bones about it, ET human hybrids. I get a kind of bell shaped curve of information. It ranges from until we in the white world who are trying to figure this out have a honest to God baseline of a DNA or RNA or whatever it is in an extraterrestrial biological entity from another planet, in another galaxy or wherever they come from, we need a baseline of this is what they are made of to compare to our RNA DNA sequencing to say, okay, this is Homo sapien, sapien. This is extraterrestrial. We can put this in a lab. We can send it around the world. Every scientist who works in genetics, hard evidence, go for it. Is there any of this in this, humans? And the argument has been given to me, Linda, until we have, 
or these particular scientists until we have a known baseline of extraterrestrial biological tissue. We can't take the Homo sapiens sapien and say we have proof that extraterrestrial X, Y, and Z from galaxy, galaxy, galaxy put their genes in the evolving primates on Earth to create these varieties of standing up primates of which Homo sapiens sapien is the latest model. And I heard a variation on that from Dr. John Altshuler, who was a pathologist and hematologist, extremely uh, seasoned mind, who became very interested in animal mutilations because of the lack of blood at excisions. And he and I worked together for about seven years, me going out and collecting tissue and, and his showing me under a microscope that the mutilation tissue was subjected to high heat, had a very certain appearance. You could see it under a microscope, and, uh, but it didn't have any carbon residue, which meant that it couldn't possibly be a laser. It had to be something else. And these all relate to the question, if, if there is a harvest of the same tissue from animals, that has been being collected since at least the beginning of the 20th century around this planet in both hemispheres, ongoing right now. You can go to earthfiles.com and see the uh, first in-depth that I have done on horse mutilations, and I'm doing more. That if there is a collection or harvesting of genetic material because ETs need it for sustenance and to make genetically manipulated containers for their needs. Can Earth scientists prove it? I've asked that question over and over and over the last 41 years since I started trying to get to the bottom of animal mutilations. And the black world, I think, without question, the black world are all the scientists and the military and government that work together in a huge underground, vast, vast subways, labs. It's all there. Maybe they have all the hard answers to this. But those in the white world, they say, very reasonably. Get us an ET, let us examine it, and compare it to Homo sapien, sapien, and then we can tell you. And until that happens, we can't tell you. So the third part of this, just from the last five or seven years, I was in a discussion with a He's a physicist, PhD, works for the government still to this day. I have been able to talk with him about four times since 2014. And he said that the current estimate by the CIA, NSA, DIA world is that 30% of the current human population on Earth is a hybrid. Well, the next question that I asked was, if 30% of the Earth population were proved hybrid, ET and human, is it a slow motion invasion? Is it a slow motion takeover? What? Why? And that physicist said to me, and I, he really knows a lot. He said, we're not sure. I, I think that your question and my difficulty in answering it 
is one of the fundamental reasons why the government of the United States, at least, has not had the press conference of all centuries and told us the truth. I think we are hybrids. But hybrids of what, with what, at what time in the timeline in the last two million years from Homo erectus, 270 million years according to DIA, and half a billion to some others. There is so much that we don't know beyond the fact that we are not alone on this planet. We are not the only conscious life form. There are others cohabiting, manipulating, harvesting, beaming up gold and metals. And it's almost as if you begin to feel like that the earth continues to be used and harvested and manipulated whether Homo sapiens sapien is ever going to wake up to the whole big picture, big picture. So right now it is very, very odd where we are in the timeline with COVID decimating a certain percentage of populations that seem to be more affected than others, while some people like tonight what is our relationship, our true relationship to the question of hybrids and hybridization? Who is doing the hybridization? To what end? And what is our future as an organic life form when people like Elon Musk said last year, for Homo sapien, he didn't say Homo sapien, for humans is what he said, for humans to remain relevant, we must become cyborgs. And he's thinking about space travel to Mars. This kind of body doesn't do well. So maybe if we knew the whole big picture, maybe Homo sapiens sapien has to move on to a different genetic makeup in order to start moving back out into the stars. And maybe that's the reason for hybridization. And if that were the reason, it could be argued that maybe it's a positive. Any way you cut it, there's genetic manipulation on this planet. The question is, by whom, for what reason? But I say to you, I have no fear. I don't want you to have fear. We need to keep going forward asking every one of these questions and a thousand million more, trying to put pressure of fact into a system that wants to keep us dumb and blind. And I reject dumb and blind. All right. Let's see where we are. We've got time for maybe one or two, three more questions. I'm Brad is doing a great job trying to keep me down to three minutes. But I feel like that we're having such profound questions that if I try to truly answer them in just three minutes, it won't be fair to you or to me. So bless you, Brad. All right, Peggy, what, what, let's go for another. I have a question from Alfredo, and he would like to know if you have ever suspected or known by fact to have an Eben as a source of information? Wow, that's a fantastic question. To the best of my knowledge, I have never stood in front of an extraterrestrial biological entity with consciousness on my part that would be in the category of any of the greys. I have had an extraordinary discussion with a blonde haired, white skinned, almost seven foot tall, 
supposedly human in a discussion about doing a documentary in Africa having to do, I had worked on child survival in UNICEF and I was approached by these individuals in Denver to join them doing another film in Africa. And I thought it was just going to be a normal meeting. Like you go to a building and you sit around a table and you talk with people and have coffee and figure out what you're going to do or not do. And the address, I ended up in a uh, apartment complex in Denver. And the person who opened the door was truly, I mean, he was 6'7", six, 6'8", six, wearing a green, deep forest green, like a turtleneck sweater, matching slacks, so he was all forest green, and had five crystals hanging on chains so that the bottom of each crystal was a measurable amount above the next crystal. So it was like five crystals hanging from five chains. And at first, I remember coming in thinking, is this a joke? What, what is this? And for about two hours, we talked about documentary. There were other, two other people there. One was definitely roly-poly human, normal. The other, I'm not so sure. But I kept getting these vibrations and feelings. I'm not with, I'm not with normal roly-poly humans here. And eventually, the tall man with all the crystals began talking about how there is a war going on in this universe and talking as if he knew about the sides of the war, the goals of the war, and that what they really wanted me to do was to help them do something to communicate about this war. And I became uh, very uneasy I'm not a person driven by fear, but I became very uneasy. And I stood up and said, uh, it's time for me to go. And the tall man moved to the door and blocked it. And at that point, it is one of those existential things. I don't know who I'm dealing with, and they don't feel entirely human, but by God, I'm going through that door. And I walked across that room like, I don't care if you're standing there, I'm getting out of here. And he did the strangest thing. He's so tall, and I'm only 5'2". And he grabbed a hold of me like this and crammed my side of my face, which only was about here on him. And in that moment of being whatever you want to call it. It was like a void, a vacuum. And I knew this isn't human. I knew it. This is not human. And whatever it is, I don't like it. And I pulled back and I grabbed for the door and I opened that door and I went out into the hallway and he called something and I didn't care and I just kept walking. Now, I was fine. I mean, whatever he was or it was, it was the soullessness. People have asked me, have you ever encountered something that you did not think had a soul? That dude. Well, what was he, the meeting was supposed to be about how we would do a film to help children in Africa. I never had an explanation, I never had a follow-up, but that may have been the one time in my life when I had an encounter with something that from my point of view, it had no soul and it felt like a vacuum.
And it's bothered me because I do, I do not think that that is the definition of extraterrestrial intelligent life in this universe. I do not. But as the theme keeps coming over and over that there are wars or a war in this universe about consciousness, about what is allowable to do with life that is organic versus inorganic matter substances, I think that's true. I think there is conflict, monitoring, and maybe if we knew the whole big picture, with something like the evolving primates on earth given a really strong soul by a divine field, would they be able to make a difference in a universe that came from an infinite number of universes in which consciousness is the experiment. And that may be what this universe is about. We have, what, six minutes? I take one more, I'll, I'll try to stay within three. <laughs> this is a lighter question, perhaps, but Alex123 would like to know, would you go on a spaceship if invited by friendly aliens? Oh, yes! Absolutely! It has been the dream of my life. Are, will we have an introduction, like for real, to everybody, of real beings that somehow we all know, yes, 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 they are friendly, they have helped us. Uh, they are uh, why uh, humanity has survived. And they said, Linda, would you like to experience a beam up, uh, go in a craft, put your hands in the panels, explore with your mind, go to the end of the Milky Way galaxy? Oh, my God. Oh, yes. As long as I can come back to dear Earth that I love to my core, and be able to help share what I saw and learned with my fellow human beings to give us hope, to give us exhilaration. If we only knew and had guarantee that we were in a universe that is not hostile against us, if we knew for a fact that there is a divine field waiting for us to wake up and tell everybody, and we're not alone, and consciousness and the soul is the whole point. Wouldn't life just, I mean, it would be so precious. You would just cherish every second of every minute of every hour of every day. But knowing that you were going to go into another cycle, another f form and keep recycling and reforming as Roger Penrose said, Linda, infinite number of threads weaving from the beginning to the end in which there is no end. And somehow I begin to have a glimmer of that and I feel exhilarated and that's what I would love for you, this whole planet, to get past all of the you versus me. It's crazy. I love you guys. Thank you for being here. This has been one of the most fun. Oh, I just, I love it. And the fact that Peggy and Serena work behind the scenes to help organize those people, those wonderful, wonderful people that have been friends of mine and, and we've had these, some of these deep conversations ourselves. I just thank you. Thank you so much. And next Wednesday, I hope full. I'm hopeful I will have another, like, 
open up another piece. And that's the way I think of these Wednesdays. If I can open up another piece and another piece, and we're all together feeling and learning and exhilarating and sometimes sobbing and aching all together, that maybe we can get past COVID, maybe we can get into the next year and go for We're Not Alone. I love you. Thank you. 150 some thousand. Let's keep going. I love you.